Hello and welcome back to Park Fermi Parley with Kieran Downey. We are straight off the back of the British Grand Prix at Silverstone, which means we are here to recap a Lewis Hamilton win. What a result. What a result. It is not the result I fully hoped for. I went into this after qualifying genuinely under the belief that we would have an all-British podium and I was ready to celebrate an all-British podium. I was also ready to celebrate Lando's second win in F1 but McLaren really screwed the pooch on that one, didn't they? So we'll come to that later. But honestly, see, watching Lewis Hamilton win for a ninth time at Silverstone was just vibes. It's one of the most heartwarming wins in F1 I've seen. And this year, we've been treated to three of them. Lando's first win, Leclerc's first home win, and now Hamilton winning at his home race. Regardless of whether you're a Hamilton fan or not, it's just the most, it's just the best thing. And him crying over the radio, and then him hugging Bono, and Bono's crying, and then his mom and his dad, and the crowds were roaring, and honestly, I was streaming. What an emotional win. Also, a fantastic race. A fantastic race. And listen, I was really worried when the race started that we were going to have a quite boring race. Because when the race started, everyone just seemed quite all right to keep position, apart from, apart from Charles Leclerc, who did gain a few positions. But, but the front runners just seemed quite okay, just holding position. And we got quite a few about 1.5 second gaps opening up between these front runners. It seemed that they were all just kind of waiting to see what would happen with the rain. Incredibly boring, to be honest with you. Incredibly boring. And then, thank God, Lando Norris decided, you know what, I'm, I'm going to make a move now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my foot down a little bit and I'm going to just, you know, get to the back of Hamilton and I'm going to start making some moves. And then we had Piastri making moves on... Verstappen, we had Leclerc making some moves, as I've said. Just a, 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 a great, it turned into a great race, and I'm so happy because it was a bit touch and go for a moment, and I was a bit worried, but my God, just brilliant, brilliant in the end. All right, so let's get right into it. We're going to start with the Haas boys and Kevin Magnussen, who qualified P17, finished the race P12. Magnussen must have been on a charge at some point because that's quite a, that's a good few positions gained in that race. And I think, to be fair, he would have benefited from some rogue strategy calls to for, for quite a few of the grid to pit for inters way too early. We'll come on to that shortly. So he definitely benefited from that and that would have just catapulted him up. And, you know, he would have managed to just retain those positions. Great race for Haas altogether, I will say, especially with Nico Hulkenberg. Nico Hulkenberg, who qualified sixth and finished sixth. This is two races in a row that that man has finished the race, P6, in a Haas. He's out-qualified both the Ferraris and he's finished ahead of his teammate and ahead of Charles Leclerc. Can I just say, it's absolutely amazing to see Nico Hulkenberg doing these things and it's exciting that you know he's going to go to Audi and hoping that they are going to be competitive at the changeover. It's unfortunate that he's having such a great season right now and then he's going to have to go and drive a, drive around at the back of the pack in a wheelie bin that is the cyber car because that car is not going to be any better next year I, I can't imagine. Just fantastic absolute scenes from Nico Hulkenberg. Just incredible. It's a shame that they're actually going to lose him next year because if Haas can continue, if Haas can continue this kind of performance, a, a Nico Hulkenberg Ollie Behrman lineup would be just dreamy. Long may this continue for Haas because, as I said, yeah, my post quali, I think it was my post quali reaction, I need them to give. Oliver Behrman a good car post practice. I need them to give Ollie Behrman a good car. So if they can give him an even better car than what, if they can take the car that they have right now and make it even better for next year, Ollie Behrman's getting good points. Now moving on to the Kick Cybers with Valtteri Bottas, who qualified P16, finished P15. Do you know if you didn't actually look at the positions 
the actual finishing numbers for the drivers. You could say Valtteri Bottas had a brilliant weekend because he finished one place behind Charles Leclerc and finished ahead of Sergio Perez. So if you were to look at that, if you were just to say that to somebody, you would think, Jesus Christ, Valtteri Bottas must have had a great race. But unfortunately not. The other two drivers just had terrible races and Valtteri actually finished P15. Similar to most weekends at the moment, there's not much to say about Bottas. He's just kind of there, floating around P15 area. He's, I mean, he finished ahead of Sergio Perez, so actually, let's just say he had a fantastic, fantastic race. Well done, Valtteri. Moving on to his teammate, Zhou Guanyu. Zhou Guanyu, who qualified P14 and finished P18. Now, you could also say, oh, Zhou Guanyu must have had an okay race because he's two positions higher than his average finish. No, no, he still finished at the back because we've had two retirements. Now, what I will say is that Zhou Guanyu was one of the four drivers who suffered greatly by a terrible strategy call, pit far too early for intermediate tyres. The other drivers were Ocon, Perez and Leclerc. They picked the cars for intermediates when it was basically a dry track and the track just chewed the tyres up completely and just put those four drivers out of out of contention for any points. Not that I ever think that Zhou Guan Yu was going to get points, but did ruin his race, to be fair, and was just never going to get it back. All right, next up, Daniel Ricciardo, who qualified P15, finished P13. Danny Rick was kind of just there, wasn't he? There was no, there was no real big moves of note. There was no real issues for him. He just was there. He came, he drove, he went home. Very similar to his teammate, Yuki Tsunoda, who qualified P13, finished P10. Now, I will say that it is nice to see Yuki getting points again, back up where he should be. He should be in and around that low points area, your P10s to about, I'd say, P7. That's where Yuki belongs with that car. So nice to see him back in the points. It is good to see him back there, especially at a time when there is all this talk about Sergio Perez. Now, I know originally the move should have been Daniel Ricciardo would take Perez's spot at Red Bull, but Danny Rick is not performing. Perez is not performing. So if you were to promote somebody into that team, in my mind, I would say Yuki Tsunoda should take the step up to Red Bull. There's no point in saying Carlos Sainz because that's just not a good dynamic to have Carlos and Max in the same team. Yuki would be perfect to take on the seat at Red Bull alongside Max. Liam Lawson can come into VCARB and you could maybe keep Daniel to help Liam, you know, just embed himself into the team. I would say that's quite a smart move, but... I don't make the decisions at Red Bull. I don't think this story with Perez is uh, over yet. I definitely think there is some things coming down the line. We'll obviously talk about Perez in a bit, but good to see Yuki back in the points. He needs to keep it there. Moving on to Williams and Alex Albon, who qualified P9, finished P9. Like Yuki Tsunoda, good to see him in the points because that is where he belongs with that Williams right now. I don't know what happened with Williams at the start of the year, but it's nice to see that whatever they're doing is working and Alex is getting some points for the team because they went far too long without scoring points and it's good to see him, good to see Alex back in the points. What's even more wild is his teammate, Logan Sargent. Logan Sargent, who qualified 12th, finished 11th. Logan Sargent was one place away from getting points. One place. Imagine if Logan Sargent had scored a point. My God, we'd be talking about it for weeks. The only time Logan Sargent has managed to score a point in F1 is when Lewis Hamilton and Charles Leclerc were disqualified after Austin. Imagine if on pure racing, he managed to score a point. I don't know what energy drinks or fuel they've been giving Logan Sargent this weekend, but the fact he qualified 12th and finished 11th, he finished in front of Charles Leclerc, 
Sergio Perez, Daniel Ricciardo, Kevin Magnussen, Esteban Ocon. Like, he finished up ahead of great drivers. What was going on with everyone else that Logan Sarge, because I have to say, no, in fact, actually, credit where credit's due, that man had a great weekend. I was going to say that, you know, everyone else must have had really bad races for Logan Sargent to be up there, but I'm not going to discredit this man's incredible weekend. Is it going to be enough to keep him, though, for this year? Don't think I'm saying that he might be getting a seat in 2025. That's crazy talk. We're not, we're not. No, no, no. Is it enough to secure him until the end? If he can keep this up and maybe, maybe score a point, this could keep him in his seat till the end of the year because James Viles has now been vocal and saying that there is, the time is coming that Williams is going to have to make a decision. He's saying that the time is coming that they're going to have to make a decision on whether they keep Logan till the end of the year or whether they get rid of Logan halfway through the season. And performances like this will secure him till the end of the year. Well done, Logan Sargent. Fantastic weekend for him. Fantastic weekend. All right, now moving on to two drivers that had a awful weekend, and that would be the Alpine drivers, and we'll start with Esteban Ocon. Ocon, who qualified P18, finished P16. Again, as I said, one of the drivers that got caught with a terrible strategy call. He was obviously had a, 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 an awful qualifying. They decided to put him on inters when the track was dry and it ruined his race. There was no way he could, they, the amount of time those drivers lost on those intermediates when that track was dry. I'm pretty sure Ted Kravitz said it was about 20 seconds at one point. For both Alpine drivers, it is a huge weekend to forget because his teammate Pierre Gasly, I mean, at least Esteban, you know, managed to do the race. His teammate Pierre Gasly, qualified P20, did not finish. Didn't even start the race. Now, I wouldn't even say Pierre qualified P20 because, yes, he took part in Q1, but he was always going to start P20 anyway because he'd incurred a 50-place grid penalty, which meant that he just started at the back. Anything over 15, your driver automatically starts at the back of the grid. And it was all new engine components. It was five new engine components he got. And then on the formation lap, off they went. And he was terribly slow going around the formation lap. Veered off into the pits and had to retire the car with, I think it was a gearbox issue. So... Is that one of the parts that they replaced on his car? No, he didn't have anything done to his gearbox. So that's, at least it's not one of the brand new parts that they had fitted to the car. But I generally thought we were going to get an Alpine double points. What the? At least I didn't make it part of my predictions. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, my Franco Colapinto prediction's not correct either because Sargent had a fantastic weekend. And you know what? I'm happy for him. Not much else to say about the Alpine boys, so let's move on to Aston Martin and Lance Stroll, who qualified P8, finished P7. Good weekend for Aston Martin, to be fair. Good weekend for Lance Stroll. Solid points. Absolutely solid points. So, well done to, to him. Fernando Alonso, his teammate, qualified P10, finished P8. Solid performance from him as well. He did actually get into a little bit of a collision with Alex Albon actually. Fantastic that Alex Albon managed to finish P9 actually because come to think of it, the contact that they had, there was a bit of bodywork that came off of Alex's car. I don't know what it was but they, they made contact in the first few corners, Alonso and Albon, and then Sargent was over the radio, he was behind Albon and he came over the radio and said there was a big bit of bodywork came off of Alex's car. So Brilliant result from Alex if the damage was anything was anything serious. Fantastic work for both the Aston Martin drivers getting solid points. It's been a long time coming that they have been languishing about at the back of the pack and now we're hopefully back on track for both of them. Moving on to the McLaren boys and we have quite a bit to talk about here. Now Oscar P. Astry qualified P5, finished P4. And Lando Norris, who qualified P3 and finished P3. McLaren have a fantastic car right now. A fantastic, brilliant racing car that is capable of challenging the Red Bulls. Fully wasting that car's potential with terrible decision making. We could have had a 1-2 McLaren podium. Lando Norris could have won and Oscar could have come P2. 
if McLaren hadn't made such terrible decision making. First, why they didn't double stack Lando and Oscar in the pits for Inters is beyond me. That They left Oscar out and they lost so much time. That extra lap killed Oscar and killed any chance of him being on the podium. Completely ruined it. They should have brought both in because Mercedes double stacked their drivers and it worked in their favour. And even Zach Brown was saying over the radio, he was with Sky Sports this weekend. They were looking at the double stack and thinking that actually the time lost for Oscar would be much less if they double stacked than if they left him out. That's generally the words that came out of Zach Brown's mouth. And then they just didn't double, they just didn't bring him in. They left him out for a whole lap. Terrible decision making from them. Absolutely awful. I don't know what the hell they were thinking. You know something, it actually really annoyed me when I seen that they'd left him out. It really pissed me off. Another bizarre call they made was with Lando Norris. Lando should have won it. It, it was a slam dunk, looked like it was a Lando win. He was flying. And then when the track was beginning to dry up and it was time for them to come off intermediates. Now, now I get drivers being asked their opinions by the teams when it comes to, should we move to intermediates now? Is it ready for slicks? Because they're actually on the track. They can feel the car underneath them and you know whether the track is ready for, if it's dry enough, if it's too wet, all these kind of things. They, they can feel it. So I understand at that point, drivers being asked their opinions on the tires. What I do not understand is why they let Lando choose what slick tire he was going on to. That should never have been made. You're literally sat on a pit wall with the information from 17 other drivers who are all on a mix of tires. Some are on intermediates, some are on mediums, Max is on a hard, Lewis is on a soft, You've got all of this information in front of you. You can see that Max is on hards and he's doing quite well there. You can see that Lewis is on softs and they're about to fall off a cliff. We know that the medium's a good tire. Put him on the goddamn medium. And then he's deciding I'm gonna go on softs because I wanna go after Hamilton, but I've got no, no way of defending against Max when inevitably, by the time it takes me to catch Hamilton, and I say me, me being Norris, by the time it takes me to catch Hamilton, my soft tires are gonna fall off a cliff, and I have nothing left to defend against Max Verstappen, who's charging at me on hards. I feel like I might pop a blood vessel. It makes no sense to me, and even they are now saying, hindsight's obviously a beautiful thing, we should never have asked, we should have just said, and all the commentators were saying, what are they doing? Why are they not just telling? You're the team. You are you are you have strategists there. Lando should have been told, box, you're coming in, you're going on mediums. Like I just don't get it. I don't get it why he was allowed to make that decision. And now they're all like, oh yep, it was the wrong choice. It was the wrong tire to put him on. We should have put him on the mediums. Continuously, such a fantastic car, and they are wasting it with terrible decision making. And I've seen so many things online, and I, I don't want to say I agree with them, but I've seen so many things online from people saying, McLaren right now do not have the mindset to be winners. They do not have it in them right now to make the decisions that will lead them to winning. Unfortunately, today, that was the case. That's all I've really got to say about McLaren, to be honest with you, absolutely, abysmal decision making uh, cost them uh, cost them a one two podium I will be very honest that's what I believe should that's what I believe should have happened that's what was going to happen and they blew it so moving on from one team that makes weird decisions to another that makes even weirder decisions Ferrari and we'll start with the driver that had an okay race and that was Carlos Sainz Carlos Sainz who qualified P7 finished P5. Very decent race from Carlos Sainz. Had a good race, no issues. Well done. That's what I need from Ferrari. Unlike what they did with Charles Leclerc, who qualified P11, finished P14. Now, I was hopeful that we were going to get some decent points from Charles. When that race started, he was flying. He was making up positions. He was up to P7. He was hunting down Stroll. He was looking good. I was happy. I was feeling hopeful. 
the sun was coming out, I was feeling better, not at Silverstone, the sun was coming out in Edinburgh, and it was just, it, everything seemed to be going okay. And then they pitted him for inters when the track was goddamn dry, and they knew it, and they knew that because everyone else was talking about it. Everyone was saying it was too dry, and they put him on enters anyway, and then he lost like 20 seconds and was at the back of the pack for half of it. He finished behind Logan Sargent on what world are we okay? Like, what are you talking about? Every weekend, I'm just disappointed. Time after time after time. Please, Ferrari, sort it out. I'm begging. Terrible strategy call. Terrible strategy call. I mean, thankfully, he managed to climb up, but he still finished behind Logan Sargent, and that I will not get over, and I cannot excuse. All right, now moving on to Mercedes, who had a fabulous weekend. Well, actually, one driver had a fabulous weekend. The other had a not-so-great weekend. So let's start with him, George Russell, who qualified P1, did not finish. What a devastating end to the weekend for George Russell. I feel so bad for him. Honestly, he had the world at his fingertips and it just fell away from him. Qualifying P1 at his home race, he had everything. He could have won. I mean, he wasn't going to, but in my mind, Lando was always going to win. Lando was faster, but he could have, you know, it, and it's just that thought of he could win and he never got the chance to actually fight for it because out of, seemingly out of nowhere, he was going round and they just, the radio message came up, box, box, we're retiring the car. And it was such, it caused such confusion. And then he comes in, retires the car with a suspected water system issue. I mean, to be fair, it's 100% the right decision because from what I've gathered, they basically couldn't cool the car down. There was The water wasn't getting circulated in the car. And it basically meant that the car would overheat and essentially explode on the track. So... I'm going to say the DNF is a lot better than fighting for a win and your car blowing up. Just a horrible end to the weekend for him. I'm gutted for him. Absolutely gutted. Oh my God. Just such a shame. Such a shame. However, his teammate, man of the day, man of the moment, Sir Lewis Hamilton, qualified P2. Finish the race, P1. Oh, what a brilliant weekend for Lewis. What an amazing race. Utterly amazing. I was on the edge of my seat. Like, it's one of those races where, similar to Imola, similar to... What was the other one? Um, well, I know Imola was definitely one, but if there had been, say, a few more laps of the Grand Prix, the driver that won may not have won. Like in Imola, I reckon that if there was a few more laps of the race, Lando would have won that race. If there was a few more laps of the British Grand Prix, do I think Max could have caught up to him and made a move? Yes, because those hard tyres, Max was flying on them and Hamilton's softs were falling. They were falling off a cliff. Thankfully, there wasn't no one. Lewis Hamilton managed to fucking win. Get in! What a result! God, I'm so, so happy. And it was just so emotional hearing Bono so happy coming over the radio and you could hear the emotion in Bono's voice and then you could hear Hamilton crying over the radio. And then the marshals give him the flag and he's driving around waving the flag at everyone and he gets out and he's huge, great big hug for Bono. They just tell they love each other so much. And then he's running out over jumps the fence, running out with a flag, and everyone, the crowd's roaring, like, oh, my God, what I would have done to have been there. Like, I just wish I was there. And then he's crying, and I was crying, and he's giving his dad a big hug, and his mum a hug. I just, oh, it was so emotional, and you could just tell how much it meant to him, and I don't think I'll ever get over it. Hamilton's win, and the emotion around it, and how happy everyone is, is one of those moments where I realised that this is just the greatest sport in the world 
And it's a, one of the reasons I just love this sport so much. The stories in it are just so goddamn beautiful. And it was oh, so nice. So, so nice. Lewis Hamilton is that man. He is the absolute goat and if you say otherwise I'm just I'm sorry you're wrong I've seen so many people since 2021 say Lewis Hamilton's washed he's not the goat Lewis Hamilton's a bad driver he should just retire uh, just shut up and moving on to our final two drivers they are the Red Bull racing drivers and it is Sergio Perez who qualified P19 started in the pits and finished P17. So Sergio Perez had to start in the pits after the team gave him a new PU. It made sense. They might as well. He was starting P19 anyway. And, you know, it wasn't going to change anything really. Could that man make any moves? No. Pretty much not. Um, it was actually, I would go as far as to say, an embarrassment uh, for Perez this weekend. Obviously, spun off in qualifying, ruined his qualifying, that's why he was starting P19, and then just couldn't do anything in the race. Couldn't do a single thing. The fact that the only driver that finished behind him was Joe Guan Yu tells you everything you need to know. Logan Sargent finished better than Perez. What, surely, surely, and I say this every weekend now, we talk and have the same conversation, me and you, the same conversation every week about how Perez needs to get better because they're going to drop him. And I am sorry, I do not understand how Red Bull can continue. Like, like even if they went to the end of this year, fine. Let them stay to the end of the year. But they cannot go into, if this is his performance, they cannot go into 2025 with him as the driver. I'm really sorry. They just... They can't. When there's so many talented drivers waiting in the wings wanting F1 seats, they couldn't They couldn't in good faith let that man continue. Come on. So we'll see what happens. I mean, Liam Lawson's testing the RB20 and it's a filming day. It's, you know, they can't, they can only do so many test days where they're actually testing a driver. But if they are filming for whatever, they can, you know, run that car. However, his teammate had a much better weekend. Max Verstappen, who qualified P4, finished P2. As I said, if there was a few more laps of that race, I reckon Max would have gotten past. He made the correct call to go on the hard tyres and just pushed and pushed and pushed. It was a brilliant race. I thought he was maybe struggling because he was just kind of letting cars pass. And then it was like a... a, a a switch had been flicked on in his brain and he was just like, right, I'm going to go now. I'm going to send it and I'm going to, I'm going to fight for this. And he, he had a smashing weekend, absolutely smashing. And that is everything for myself after a fantastic, fantastic British Grand Prix. The end of our triple header. That's us done. And I'll tell you something. And obviously that I know those guys will be because they have the actual the hardest job. But I am exhausted. I'm ready to have a week without a Grand Prix. I will say that. But that is everything for me. I will be back. If anything happens, do not worry. I will be back. I'm suspecting we're not far away from some Carlos Sainz news. I also am suspecting that we are, we've got two race weekends before the summer break. And I am thinking that we might get Carlos Sainz news and Esteban Ocon news because there is, the rumours are going that Haas is ready to announce Ocon as signing on. So that uh, may be coming in a, within the next few weeks. And fingers crossed because I'm wanting bums on seats now, please. Thank you. But have a lovely rest of your day. I will see you later. Love you. Bye.